In the previous videos, we covered unsupervised learning with discrete latent variable models. In the upcoming videos, we will consider continuous latent variable models instead. And before we move on to a full probabilistic interpretation of such models, uh, we start off with a non-probabilistic version of it. Today, we will talk about principal component analysis. It is a method for dimensionality reduction, which can be derived via several principles. Now, in this video, we will derive principal component analysis via a maximum variance formulation. And in the next videos, we will derive it using a minimal reconstruction error viewpoint and a probabilistic viewpoint. Now, the main goal of such continuous latent variable models really is dimensionality reduction. So the goal is dimensionality reduction. Um, where we treat our data. So our data lives in a high dimensional space. For example, my image can be of 100 by 100 pixels, uh, but we're going to assume that actually the, the true underlying data structure is of lower dimension. And maybe this is best explained by an example such as uh, the following. So let's say we are observing these images of a tree and this tree is generated by uh, well, by, by shifting it, so by translating it a, li a little bit to the right or to the, uh, to the top, uh, rotate it a little bit. So we have all these images that uh, represent a tree and this tree is rotated and translated. Now, the images in itself are highly high dimensional, right? So they're 100 by 100, so let's say 10,000 pixels and each pixel value can take on really any value on the real line. But so if I were to generate one random image, I would have so many possibilities for, uh, I could pick a value for each of these 10,000 values. Uh, so that's what we see. We see all these images consisting of these 10,000 pixel values, but we see a lot of similarities uh, between these images, right? And now, especially in this particular case, once you realize that all these images are a tree, it's just that they're translated and, and rotated, uh, this actually means that if I have one core representation, this particular tree, then actually my latent space only consists of three parameters. So that would be the, trans the two, two translation parameters and one rotation parameter. So if I have this core representation of the tree, then I can generate any of these images with just three values. Now that's the idea about dimensionality reduction. Uh, we assume that there is such a structure that actually my data comes from a lower dimensional space and what we observe may be high dimensional but intrinsically it, it's it's of low dimension and we want to recover this particular uh, manifold or this particular low dimensional description of the data. Now of course this is a very simplistic example right but the idea of such lower dimensional uh, manifolds it makes sense and it works in a lot of applications but if we stick for example to this uh, digit recognition uh, example uh, we could consider the latent space to be much bigger, right? Uh, there's so much variations uh, that take place. Uh, we could consider scaling, for example. Uh, we could consider not just the digit tree, but all digits uh, zero to nine. We could consider different colors and different handwriting styles, and, and this goes on, right? But still, even if you consider all those variations that you can expect, then it's very probable that the, the number of latent variables will still be much fewer than the, the 10,000 dimensions that my images really have. So the, the, the size of this vector space. So it makes sense to proceed in, into this direction of dimensionality uh, reduction, right? Now, in this example, uh, the latent space is a nonlinear transformation of the image, right? Because I cannot just uh, transform like a scaling parameter in one step to an image. It probably is a very complicated model to do so. But in principle, this is how we could treat it. So we're searching for this uh, latent subspace uh, which we can then transform to our final observation. So these actual digits via some model and this model can be highly nonlinear. Uh, maybe that uh, I'll, I'll cover that a little bit in, in uh, video 10.4. Uh, but for now, we really stick with latent variable models uh, that represent a linear embedding of my data. And later we consider the generalizations uh, to, uh, to the nonlinear case. So that's what we're going to do. We're, we're going to find a linear projection of the data and we're going to do it in such a way that the variance of this projected data is maximal. So what we're essentially after in this principal component analysis framework with this maximum variance approach is that we, we have this high dimensional data. So we have points in a high dimensional space and we observe variations in several directions. And our task is to, to recover these uh, principal directions, these 
principal component among which the variation is, is maximal. So, so the idea is that we, uh, for example, measure high dimensional uh, vectors. Uh, I can only draw this in 2D now, so 2 is high dimensional in this case. So we have all these measurements and we want to reduce these 2D measurements to just a 1D uh, component. Uh, so what, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the, the axis of maximal variation. For example, if I take a look at this data, it's elongated in one structure. So we have a lot of variation in this direction, little variation in this direction. So if I'm going to make a projection, um, it's best I do it along this direction and maybe not so relevant to do it along this direction. So our objective now is to recover these axes of uh, maximal variations and these axes will be called principal components. So this is again summarized over here, maybe now in a bit more detail. So I have this data set of, of points, observe, these observations which lie in some d-dimensional space. Again, here's a 2D uh, visualization. So these are my uh, 2D observed uh, data points. And now I want to project this to a lower dimensional space. So I want to project it on this line. So now a 2D point is represented with a 1D point somewhere on this line. And this projections will, uh, will be done via orthogonal projections, right? So if I have this data point, I look for the closest point on this direction, on this line, and that will be my new embedding. And then my objective is to find this direction among which uh, the, the variation in my point is large. So if I look at this, I have variation is large. And of course, this is a relative notion of variance. So let me pick another direction for to compare it with. Suppose I picked this direction. So this will would have been my, my uh, U1. Now, if I project the points to this uh, particular line, uh, then this point ends up over here, this point somewhere over here, uh, this one over here, this one over here. Then along this line, I actually have a, a smaller variation in comparison to the projection to this uh, purple line over here, indicated in green, this variance. So my objective now is to find a direction, U1, uh, that results in a maximum ver variance of the projected points onto this uh, line. Okay, so that is going to be my objective. And then instead of, so now this was a, a 2D to 1D mapping, an example, but in general, we consider D-dimensional uh, data points and we're going to project it to m-dimensional um, hypersurfaces or lower dimensional uh, spaces where m is assumed to be given. And now we, before we proceed, I just want to recap some uh, basic definitions that we've seen many times actually. So the mean is defined as, as follows. So we indicate it with uh, an overline x. So that will indicate the mean over all my data points. And then we have a covariance matrix obtained in the following way. And such a covariance matrix is then uh, given to be symmetric and positive definite. And these are some properties which we will uh, use later on. Okay, now let's try to build this up from a simple concept. And we start off with a 1D projection. So my data is d-dimensional and I want to project my data now onto this uh, one-dimensional line using this as a direction vector. Then the projection of such a data point onto this vector so it's simply given by taking this, this inner product, the scalar product. Uh, this essentially gives me a single value, right? It gives me a scalar value, which I'm going to know with Zn1, and it's just a single value. Okay, and then we can also obtain uh, the mean of all these projections simply by uh, projecting the mean itself. And this actually directly follows from um, linearity of, of, of the mean. And with this, I mean, if I take the expectation over my uh, new um, projected values, I could do that by, of course, taking the expected value over these uh, projections. But by linearity of this expectation, I can take this uh, projection vector outside and order it in the following way. So you see, we can also first compute the mean of my data and then project it. Okay, but that, that's just a useful property. So what we're really after was this direction vector u1 and also really the length of a direction isn't too important. Actually, we're only interested in the direction itself, right? So we're going to search for uh, direction vectors u1 which have a length one. So we normalize this, uh, this direction vector.
Okay, so the objective is to find the vectors u1 that really result in a projection with maximal uh, variance. So uh, let's take a look at the variance of the projected data. So the variance of this uh, projected component. Okay, so that's given here, right? So the, the, the average over the, the square distance of each projection to its mean. And we can see we can write it out into a convenient form. So first by starting off recognizing that this u1 uh, can be factorized in the following way. So then we have this form. And if we then write it out, so we expand the square, uh, we see that we can write it in the, in the following way. Because this is a scalar product uh, between two vectors and I can change the order by putting a transpose and moving this to the left, put a transpose there, and that gives me this term uh, multiplied with, well, the term that I already have. So this is nothing else as rewriting. And then because these u1s do not uh, depend on my index n, I, I can keep the, I can pull this sum inside, and that gives me the following. And this we do recognize, right, as uh, the covariance of x, which we denoted with uh, this matrix S. Okay, so that gives me this very convenient expression for the variance of my projections, right? So this is what we were computing, the variance of my uh, projection in this uh, direction, um, u1. So this variance is really nicely given in a very uh, convenient way. Okay, and that's what we were doing, right? We were set out to maximize the variance of my projections. And so this is the variance of my projections and we want to maximize this, but we have to do this under this constraint that the, the, the length of this vector is one, right? Because if I do not do this, then maximizing this, we're just picking a u1, which is incredibly large. So then my objective would be infinite. So I really need this constraint. So let me write that down over here. Okay, so we're dealing with a constraint maximization problem. And we covered this before and we spent a separate video on this. Um, so we can do this via the method of Lagrange multipliers. And this method relied on the definition of a Lagrangian. So I had to define a function that I'm optimizing. So that, that's this particular thing. So f of u1 plus my Lagrange multiplier times my constraint function minus c, where this is my uh, constraint function. And then the steps were to, to compute the stationary points of this Lagrangian with respect to the parameters that you're optimizing, meaning that we have to take the derivative of my Lagrangian with respect to uh, u1, and that's given as follows, all right? It directly follows from this. And we set it to zero and then solve it for u1. So if we do this, so we compute this derivative, we solve it for u1, so we can write it in the following way, which really tells us that uh, the u1 that satisfies this constraint is an optimizer of my constraint uh, optimization problem. And this is uh, what you may recall from your uh, linear algebra course. This is that we have to uh, solve a uh, eigensystem uh, problem. So whenever we see this, that this matrix times a vector is the same vector but just scaled with a, a scalar, such a vector is called an eigenvector and this particular scalar, this lambda one, is called an eigenvalue. So this is a particular system of equations uh, called uh, an eigensystem. So this tells us that we're looking for u1 and lambda one, which are resp respectively called the eigenvector and eigenvalues of my matrix S. And in this particular context of principal component analysis, these u1s will be called principal components. But so these principal components are essentially the eigenvectors of my uh, matrix S. And then using this uh, identity, you can show that the variance of the projected uh, data is really given by a lambda one, right? So in the previous slide, we showed that if we project our data point onto such a vector, uh, then take a look at the variance, that this variance is given by u1 s u1. So this is the variance, and if we see that s times u1 uh, satisfies uh, this, this eigen uh, system constraint and we can re replace s u1 with lambda u1 and since so okay let me do that so u1 transpose lambda 1 u1 that's lambda 1 u1 transpose u1 and that equals lambda 1 because well I have this constraint that uh, these vectors are of a unit length. So that tells me that um, 
Like uh, an, a matrix S has in principle as many eigenvectors as, as its dimension, right? So I can pick any of these U1s and that will be an optimizer of, of this problem. But really I'm looking for the one that maximizes this, uh, this function over here. And this function, the value of this function for a particular U1 is given by its eigenvalue. So this tells me that really uh, we are searching for the eigenvalue vector with largest eigenvalue. Okay, so we just looked at the one dimensional projection case. So if you were to pick one direction to which we want to project our data, then let it be the eigenvector with uh, the largest eigenvalue. But if you want to project this to an m dimensional space, then it turns out then we just need to select the, the m largest uh, eigenvectors, which really means it's going to be the, the vector of all these uh, projections at n1, at n2, etc., where each component is given by the projection onto well the first eigenvector and then the second is obtained by projecting to the second eigenvector etc and that is indicated as follows right so our projection is going to be obtained in the following way and before we uh, do this projection we take the conven convention that we first center all our data points around uh, the mean which really means if I have this uh, data set of points what I'm first going to do is I'm first going to subtract the mean, which puts it around the origin, and then we project it on uh, the principal uh, directions. All right, so that is what we do with uh, principal component analysis. And this UM is then uh, the matrix in which all my uh, eigenvectors are put, the largest eigenvectors, or the eigenvectors with largest eigenvalues, that's how I should call it, are put next to each other. And these eigenvectors are then indeed called uh, the principal components. So what we can do, we can compute all these eigenvectors and eigenvalues, and we sort them in a decreasing uh, eigenvalue size. So the largest ones uh, will be indexed with one and then two, and the smallest one will be indexed with, uh, with the M, the M uh, eigenvalue. And because our matrix S is positive semi-definite, also my eigenvalues will be uh, positive. Okay, so it makes sense to select uh, the eigenvalue vectors with largest eigenvalue because then you can show that the total variance of the, the projected data is given simply by the sum of these eigenvalues. And we want this to be as large as possible. We want to capture the most variation. So we really need to pick the vectors with largest uh, eigenvalue. And I suppose this is really a definition, right? The, uh, the total uh, variance, because typically we talk about covariance of those uh, m-dimensional uh, vectors. The covariance matrix, it's a matrix. And now we want to reduce it to a single number. So what you could do, what's often done is to simply take the trace of the covariance matrix. And this gives you a quantity that characterizes uh, the total variance. And then you can show that the trace of the covariance matrix of my uh, projected vectors uh, set, that this is given by the sum of the eigenvalues. I'm going to show that in the next slide, actually. So now the idea of these such eigen decompositions is that if I work with symmetric positive semi-definite matrices, then I can make the following factorization of my matrix S. So I can de decompose this into a diagonal matrix. So on this diagonal matrix, I have all the eigenvalues and these U's are then my eigenvectors. So the U's are the orthonormal uh, eigenvectors. And the idea is as follows. So suppose I have my uh, data and I have all these uh, data points, so centered around the origin. Then originally these data points are expressed in, well, uh, the, the basis that you usually work with. Then what these U matrices do, they really apply a rotation uh, to my data because they are, are uh, orthonormal. It means that if I uh, multiply with this matrix, so if I multiply with uh, U transpose, I'm actually performing a rotation of my data. So what I actually, I'm rewriting my data points in terms of these vectors. In terms of these eigenvectors actually. So I have this uh, covariance uh, matrix which characterizes, uh, well, the covariance in my data. And I can describe this covariance also now in, uh, in an orthonormal basis where this covariance is really a diagonal matrix and I can always rotate it back to my original form uh, by using this uh, orthonormal transformation. So yeah, this decomposition can be thought of as a uh, change 
of bases where we really apply a, a rotation. Now I really hope you recall such things from your linear algebra course, otherwise maybe this is indeed maybe a bit, bit abstract. Uh, but I really want to show you this, that we can me make such decompositions and that it implies some nice results actually. For example, if we look at the total variance of, of my data, um, then this is given by the trace of my covariance matrix as I explained before. Now this covariance matrix can now be decomposed in the following way. And a property of the, the trace is actually that I can shift uh, the matrix inside this, this trace, which would give me U transpose U. And since this is an orthonormal basis, this matrix uh, multiplication results in an identity, right? Because I have uh, an orthonormal basis. So U Y transpose U J is one only if y equals j and it's zero otherwise. So if I evaluate all these matrix factor multiplications, I actually end up with the identity, meaning I have this uh, diagonal matrix lab that times the identity. Well, that doesn't do anything. So I end up with the trace of my diagonal matrix. So this implies that uh, my total variance is simply given by the sum of all my eigen eigenvalues. Okay, so here's a practical note. So this whole PCA boils down to this uh, eigen decomposition of my covariance matrix, right? And this, uh, there's, there's plenty of tools to, to do this actually, uh, though a full eigen decomposition is typically quite expensive. So as mentioned, we talk about high dimensional data here, which we want to reduce. And computing the full eigen uh, decomposition is of the order d to the power three. So this is super expensive. Uh, but in practice, so and that's we're set out to to reduce the di dimensionality. So we're looking for an m which is smaller than d, and that actually means that they only need up to the mth component. And there's efficient algorithms uh, to do that. So that that really uh, reduces the complexity uh, quite a bit. Um, for example, in Python, you could rely on the, such methods for singular value decomposition, but I really want to make the remark here that singular value decomposition is a sort of generalization of this eigen uh, decomposition that also works for uh, matrices that are not necessarily positive uh, definite, but in the case that your matrix is positive definite, then the singular value decomposition uh, simply boils down to the eigen uh, value decomposition. So this is just a reminder, there's so many tools out there to compute your eigenvalues and eigenvectors and try them out. Some are really highly specialized for symmetric uh, positive definite matrices and uh, well, some, some are faster than others. And this really tells you that you can either rely on a singular value decomposition or eigen uh, decomposition tools. Okay, so we have a way of computing these low dimensional uh, projections and we do this via the principal components. Uh, but still, how do we choose the number of components? Basically, I started off by saying that M is given, uh, but of course you always need to choose this in some way. And what we can do is we can take a look at, um, well, how much variance I'm actually discarding by picking a particular M. So a good way would be, for example, uh, so the idea is I want to project to this lower dimensional space and I want to preserve 90% uh, preserve of my variance. So let's say that is our target. Then I can pick the M such that this is indeed the case. Because uh, remember that the total variance of my projection was simply given by the sum over the, uh, of the eigenvalues um, corresponding to the eigenvectors that are used in my projection. So this sum from uh, j is one to m of lambda j gives me the total variance of my projection. And if I compare the ratio with my total variance of my unprojected data, um, then I can evaluate this for different m, right? And that gives me the, the following plot. So you see, if I only use one component, then I lose a lot of uh, variation in my data, uh, but it quite quickly increases. And only, let's say after five components, I already passed this 90% uh, threshold. And at some point it flattens off close to 100%. So it means that there are a lot of components that can easily be, be discarded because they only uh, account for very little variation in my data. And this little variation is typically considered noise. So this means that the main structure of the data, the main variation in the data can be captured with just a, a couple of such uh, principal components.
All right, so what can we use PCA for? Uh, first of all, our objective was dimensionality reduction. And this makes sense when we have very large dimensional data, right? And we want to reduce computation time. For example, if we project to this lower dimensional space, we and we consider a neural network or some logistic regression uh, model. And if you use these lower dimensional projections as input, we have simply less computations and multiplications to perform, right? So it really reduces computation time, but we can also use it for compression. If we want to store this data, um, well, then storing the lower dimensional uh, projection obviously saves you a lot of uh, storage space. But also from a point of view of overfitting and regularization, uh, this also makes sense. We saw that if my classification models have a lot of parameters, and for example, if you could consider logistic regression, then I need a parameter for each of these uh, input uh, values in my vector. Uh, so I have a lot of parameters and therefore a high chance of overfitting. And so if I'm able to reduce the dimensionality of my data, I need less parameters and therefore I maybe also need less data points because I'm less prone to, to, to do overfitting. And then finally, in, in this context, uh, PCA can also be considered as a method for feature selection. And it's actually something not covered in this course, but there are methods that given my high dimensional uh, data vector, I'm going to select only the features that are relevant. We actually saw a little bit about this in the, the lasso case for uh, L1 regularized um, regression. So that's a way for feature select selection. But then PCA can also be considered as a sort of feature selection method, but I would rather call it a feature extraction method. So from all this high dimensional vector, um, just pick the things that are relevant, combine them into one new representation. So PCA really learns new representations of my input that capture uh, most information or most variation in the data. Another application is that of a 2D visualization of high dimensional data. Now, in this case, we consider uh, the digits, uh, the MNIST digits. Um, I think they're actually 28 by 28, but it, it doesn't matter. So um, images with a lot of pixels. And of course, also these can be treated as vectors, right? So we can flatten such an image, which gives me just one big vector for all these uh, pixel value. And I can compute, uh, do principal component analysis on such vectors, which really mean that if I uh, do this PCA on all my in images, and here green means a low variation, uh, red means a variation in, let's say, a negative direction, and blue in a positive direction. So this is a represent representative direction in my space of digits. Meaning if I want to make a distinction between uh, different uh, data points, I have to look for those regions uh, indicated in blue and red, uh, really. So once I have computed such principal components, I can project my images onto such uh, components, which gives me two values, like how much does my image resemble this particular pattern and how much does it resemble uh, this particular pattern. And that, that gives me these two components and I can plot those and then I can visualize how similar points are uh, to each other. And that's what you see over here. And it's nice to see that actually this one is clearly distinct from all the other points. Uh, this is the four, it's, it's completely different uh, from all the other points. The zero is also somewhat easy to uh, distinguish from the others, but there's a lot of overlap between the trees and the twos. So just by, looking, just by making this visualization, I already get a feeling that if I want to build a classification framework, it is going to be hard to classify uh, the twos uh, from the trees because well, uh, you have a two like this and maybe a three like this. It's somewhat similar. Um, and that is nicely captured and visualized via such, uh, well, uh, PCA type visualizations. Now, another nice side effect of PCA is that the features that are obtained, so these projected uh, features, they have no correlation in this uh, projected space. And with, I, with that, I mean the following, right? So actually I, I made this drawing many times already. So if, my, if I have my original data points, so according from, to some distribution, uh, so those are vectors which have, let's say, an x1 and x2 component. And with correlation, I mean that if I observe a large x1, then I also observe a large x2. Now we already saw that if we express this in, um, in terms of my uh, principal components, then we actually apply a rotation, a change of basis essentially from my uh, canonical basis to my 
principal component basis, which rotates the data to be aligned uh, with the axis. So then we no longer see the strand that with increasing component one, I also have an increasing value in the other uh, components. So this, so this is what I mean with um, there's no correlation in this uh, projected space. And this also means that uh, the covariance matrix of the projected data is diagonal, right? So this diagonal covariance matrix means really that there's no correlation uh, between my, my feature values and it can nicely be derived. And I did a similar thing uh, just before. This is the covariance matrix. If I write it out, so this is one particular projection. I take the product of these projections. So that's this over here. It can be written out in the following way. So uh, my basis transformation multiplied on the left with my covariance matrix and then on the right. And my covariance matrix could be decomposed via this eigenvector uh, uh, decomposition. And because my eigenvectors are orthonormal, this will re actually result in a matrix, which is diagonal for a large part. And then the remaining components are all zeros. Right, where we have uh, D columns, D columns, where these are the first M columns, and these are the remaining D minus M columns, and I have M rows. And that then gives you the final property that my uh, covariance matrix is this diagonal uh, matrix consisting of uh, the eigenvalues. You can actually also derive this uh, using the property that U I S U I equals uh, lambda I. Uh, but that's uh, okay. That's something for you to verify that, that this is indeed true. Okay. But the main point is that my covariance matrix of the projected data is a diagonal matrix consisting of these uh, eigenvalues. And then we can use this property to go one step further. So what we did here was we showed that, well, my projections have no correlation in them, but we can also now use this property to make this a circular, an isotropic covariance matrix simply by scaling using these eigenvalues. And that is called widening. And this widening is sometimes also referred to as sphering, right? So I'm turning my distribution into some uh, spherical uh, distribution. And this operation is relevant in quite some applications where we have to deal with standardization. So standardization typically refers to the notion of subtracting the mean of my data and divide by the standard deviation. And you do this because sometimes you have to deal with different uh, data sets that encode the same thing, but are, are acquired in a slightly, maybe with different devices, for example. And uh, depending on the calibration, uh, maybe in one device, the data points are a bit drifted off or scaled uh, differently than, other, uh, uh, than on other devices. So you want to standardize uh, your measurements such that you can combine them essentially. And so what, what, that's what you do with PCA. You can widen the, the, the data by applying one step more. So what we already did, we centered and decorrelated the data. So the centering by subtracting the mean and then decorrelating uh, by rotating this to my new basis. But and then if I want uh, my covariance matrix of, of Z to be uh, to have unit standard deviation and like a diagonal uh, identity matrix as a standard deviation, then I have to multiply it with the square root of this uh, diagonal um, eigenvalue matrix. So these steps are really as follows. So I have my data, I have this point cloud somewhere over here. Then in the first step, I sub subtract the mean, which gives me the data aligned on my origin. Then I project it to my new uh, basis, to my principal components, which really implies this rotation of the data points. And then I rescale it with one over the square root of my diagonal matrix, which really encodes the, the covariance of my uh, projected data. And this would result in a spherical data distribution. Okay, so we covered principal component analysis by searching for the direction on which I could project my data and that led to a maximal variance in this new, new representation. And it turned out that uh, these principal directions or these principal components were obtained by selecting the eigenvectors of my covariance matrix that correspond to the largest eigenvalues. Now in the next video, we're going to give a slightly different interpretation to PCA based on the idea of projecting, projecting my data points to a lower dimensional space from which I am still able to recover my original data points without too much loss of information.